Hello, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Manu Kakopian, and we are joined today by UFC President Dana White, who is gearing up for UFC 259 as he stages the trio of championship fights featuring the sport's best pound-for-pound -pound fighters from around the world. Dana, this will be the seventh time in UFC history that you'll be featuring three title fights on the same card. Why do you believe UFC 259 is the most intriguing one yet? Well, listen, I don't know if it's the most intriguing ever, but it is stacked top to bottom with not only three title fights, but great fights, up and coming talent. Uh, and, and, you know, you know, when you got a, a good card, I'm excited about it. My whole staff here is excited about it. The Internet's buzzing about it. Everything you post is, is pulling numbers off the charts. So, um, you know, th this is definitely a big one this weekend. Uh, last time you guys had some numbers tracking through the roof was UFC 257 with Conor McGregor and Dustin Poirier. For that one, you told me you guys sold 1.6 million pay-per-views. Uh, what's UFC 259 tracking towards selling? Yeah, no, this thing's doing really well. We were just talking, you know, I, I posted the, I love the show opens. The show opens make me crazy. And, uh, you know, they get you fired up for the fight. You get the goosebumps, the whole thing. We posted that thing and pulled over a million views in less than 24 hours. So, you know, you, you kind of get your finger on the pulse of, of, of how a fight is doing. This thing is doing exceptionally well. It's going to be a good weekend. No, you, you speak a million. That's on your personal social media. But do you think this fight has the, the ingredients to crack a million buys on pay-per-view? Yeah, I mean, what's been happening for us lately, you know, we went through, you know, COVID in 2020 and, and, and continued to run the business. And ever since then, something that we thought would pull, you know, I'll just throw it out. Something we thought would pull 300,000 uh, pay-per-view buys was doing six or seven. So our numbers have been, we're, we're on fire right now, man. Our business as a whole is on fire. Well, speaking of big business, uh, congratulations on your partnership with DraftKings today and having them become the official sports book and daily fantasy partner of the UFC. Uh, how is this deal going to help the UFC grow moving forward and allow you to reinvest into the company at the same time? Thank you. I appreciate it. And yeah, I mean, you know, obviously that's the other big thing that happened during, uh, you know, during the pandemic is that betting on UFC went through the roof. And, um, you know, th this thing is a game changer um, for fans and people who like to play, uh, you know, daily fantasy games. You know, these guys are going to have a ton of UFC betting info, uh, prop bets and, and betting lines and payouts, fantasy games and, and things like that. And we, we think that it's going to create a lot more engagement in the sport with not only fans, but people who probably have never watched the UFC before. So it's, it's one of the most important deals we've ever done. And since we're on the subject of betting, let's get straight to it with a prediction in the main event. UFC lists Israel Adesanya as a 230 favorite over 185 underdog Jan Blahovich. How do you see this fight unfolding? Yeah, it's an interesting fight because when you think about it, the, the, you know, the undefeated middleweight champion is moving on to take, moving up to take on the light heavyweight champion. And a lot of fans don't know a lot about Blahovich, but what you got to know is this guy's got eight wins by knockout, nine by submission. Anywhere this fight goes, this guy is capable of finishing the fight. Um, and another thing stylistically that makes this fight fun, uh, Blahovich is a former Muay Thai world champion, and Adesanya is a former kickboxer. So stylistically, this fight couldn't be any more fun. And it's one of those fights where Adesanya is this rising star, undefeated, if he wins, he just continues his rise to superstardom. Blahovich, this is almost like his coming out party. You know, if he stops Israel and wins this fight, people will be talking about him on Sunday. And of course, he, Israel's your 185 champion. He's moving up to 205, and who knows if he's even going to crack that. Uh, we'll find out really soon. But do you think Israel is being a bit overambitious by jumping up heavyweight? at this stage of his career? Or do you think his power will carry over and he'll equally be a problem as a multi-division champion and fighter for you? He was 75-4 and four as a kickboxer, okay? He's 20-0 and 0 as a mixed martial artist in the UFC, the toughest, uh, you know, the toughest place in the world to fight. This, this dude can fight. 
So he's 30 years old. It's now or never, man. This guy's making a move. He doesn't, what I love about this kid, he doesn't want to be the middleweight champion. He doesn't want to be the light heavyweight champion. He wants to be one of the greatest fighters of all time. He's talking about after beating Blahovich, moving up to heavyweight and fighting John Jones, who's looked at as the GOAT. One of the things that you have to love about Israel Adesanya is this dude continues to test himself. He wants to be known as the greatest. And uh, guys like him are what make this exciting. Dana, I know you're a betting man. And with the great news that you had today with DraftKings for the company, would you put money down that Israel Adesanya, John Jones fight is going to happen? <laughs> it's going to depend on what happens this Saturday night. And this Saturday night is obviously uh, 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 the key to the whole thing. John Jones is the former longtime light heavyweight champion, and Blahovich is no joke. So if, if Adesanya can come in and beat Blahovich, there's a pretty good chance you're going to see him and John Jones. Do you think Israel has the makings to be the best MMA fighter of all time? If he continues on this course, if he ends up being undefeated, like 75 and four as a kickboxer, 20 and 0 here. He's already one of the greatest fighters ever. I mean, look at what the guy has accomplished and what he's done. And if he can continue to make the moves and do the things that he plans on doing, he absolutely will be. Speaking of greats, let's talk about the greatest woman's fighter of all time. I know Amanda Nunez right now is steamrolling through the competition. Her last two fights have went the distance in the full five rounds. As we all know, you don't get paid by the minute in the fight game. Do you think she needs a stoppage over Megan Anderson to further add to her mystique at this point? Her last fight that went to a decision was against Jermaine Durandame, who is one of the greatest female kickboxers, if not the greatest of all time. So, I mean, you have to look. When you say, oh, she went to a decision, you got to look at who she fought and what, what, you know, what the situation was. <clears throat> she is by far and away the greatest female fighter in combat sports history. And, you know, def simultaneously defending two titles at the same time, 35 and 45, uh, which is almost impossible to do. And she's going in against Megan Anderson, which she's a huge favorite. But let's not forget, the, the female division is very exciting. You know, you have tons of real technical women, you know, fast-paced fights, in-your-face, nonstop. Very few women can knock other women unconscious. Most women don't have that kind of power. Both of these women do. Megan Anderson has six wins by knockout, three by submission. So she has that power. This is a very dangerous fight for both of them. I, I see one of these women getting KO'd in this fight, and everybody's overlooking Megan Anderson, which is crazy. It, it's like two big heavyweights with knockout punching power. You never know what's going to happen. That's what you have in this fight here. And speaking with great punching power, uh, Piotr Jan, who is coming off back-to-back -back KO with over two of the sport's favorite yet faded fighters in Uriah Faber and Jose, Jose Aldo, does a win over Aljamain Sterling prove he's the real deal, or will it be too soon to coronate him at that point? 100%, you're correct. I mean... Uh, as awesome as Peter Yan has looked and the things that he's done, look at how good Aljamain Sterling has looked in his last few fights. I think that Aljamain Sterling has finally come into his own. He, th this kid has completely grown up um, uh, mentally, physically, emotionally, and as a professional fighter. This is the, the perfect fight at the right time, the right place between two studs in their prime. Right. And um, this is UFC 259, Dana, but you got, a, you got a company and a full roster of fighters. Let's talk about the company as a whole for a few. Uh, you released some popular fighters of late, uh, mo notably Junior Dos Santos, Alistair Overeem, Joe Romero. Uh, I'm curious, uh, these are some very popular fighters, yet you're, you're releasing them. I know you've hinted that you're going to be trimming the roster down in recent months, but why is the right time now to get rid of these fighters? Well, we're always trimming the roster down. Every weekend, guy, new guys come in and, and, and other guys go out. Um, and, and I think that these speak for themselves. I mean, when, when you look at, uh, you know, people were wondering if there were problems, whatever. Alistair Overeem has never turned down a fight. Uh, Junior Dos Santos is one of the nicest guys ever in the history of the sport, former world champion of ours. 
we have nothing respect for both guys, but I think, you know, these speak for themselves. I mean, if you look at age, uh, wins and losses, it's, it's just, it's, it's time. Yeah. They're definitely on the wrong side of 35. Uh, that's, <laughs> I know you're, um, as you move on from these older fighters, you've alluded to revitalizing the UFC pipeline and finding new talent by kind of funding local MMA promotions who've been sidelined by COVID. Um, how do you plan on investing into the MMA hotbed of Southern California, for example? It's a great, it's a great question. So, you know, UFC Fight Pass, we've been signing some of these, uh, some of these other leagues that are running right now so that, you know, people can watch these fights. Now, normally before the pandemic, you know, there's fights going on all over the world every weekend. Very limited now. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be interesting to see how that impacts the sport in the next five years. So you're essentially looking to kind of have your own minor <coughs> system by partnering with the other companies, have it as a feeder? What, what we've done is cut television deals with some of these guys and uh, give them an avenue for, for fans to see that, these up-and-coming fighters and these guys get some revenue so that they can continue to uh, run their shows. Mm -hmm. Speaking of identifying new talent, uh, celebrities have a big thing for boxing these days. Uh, would you approve a social star to step into the UFC cage? Listen, I've done some things to see how they, you know, I brought Brock Lesnar in, CM Punk. If you look at boxing in the state of boxing and, and, and where it keeps heading, it just keeps getting worse and worse. They couldn't, Think about boxing over the last hundred years, right? How much revenue it's brought in. Every time these guys put on an event now, it's like a going out of business sale. They're trying to get as much money out of you as they could possibly get. Now, boxing is exhibitions. They're putting on exhibitions for boxing. You know, you got kids like Jake Paul fighting and, and, and people are talking about it. Boxing writers are writing about it. They can't get out of their own their own way, man. They, they just keep beating their head against the wall. Well, you've liked to said in the past that uh, you want fighters who move the needle. It's clear guys like Jake Paul move the needle. If he wanted to fight Conor McGregor in the UFC cage, and if Conor wanted that too, is that something you would approve? Well, a few years ago, uh, Bieber was talking about fighting Tom Cruise. How many pay-per-view buys do you think that would do? Should it happen? Probably not. It shouldn't happen, but it will sell. You're always, there's always going to be a market for, you know, this famous person to fight this famous person. There's always going to be a market for that, but that, that's not what I do. I, I'm looking for the greatest fighters on the planet. I'm looking for the best up and coming talent. I'm looking for a kid like Israel Adesanya who can come in and, and go on an undefeated run, move up the light heavyweight, and then hope to fight John Jones at heavyweight someday. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for, you know, the boxing fights that used to happen in the 80s and the 90s, you know? When, when you had Riddick Bowe versus Holyfield, you had, you know, tons of great fights. Those days are long. Absolutely, Dana. And lastly, this question comes in from one of our readers, and I'll uh, share it with you as they had it. What are your goals for the remainder of this year in order to help elevate the sport of MMA? Great question. Again, uh, you know, I'm excited about this year. You know, we went through 2020 and went through COVID and, and, and it's what set up this great year that we're having now. And I, I'm going to be coming out with some announcements this year that are just, you know, every year we continue to take the sport to another level. And this year's no different. I'm excited for what we have coming down uh, the pipe, and I can't wait to share it with everybody.